one of the memories comes right after this where you you guys are hiding at someone's house. People show up to attack the man they're staying with. Yeah, can you tell us about that? We had had a friend of my mother's uh, who came to stay with us. He had a daughter that was in uh, Synodon as well and a wife, ex-wife. I'm not sure whether they were divorced yet or not at that point. And she would go back and forth between living with us and living with their mom and Synanon. There was a big court case because a bunch of people who had left were suing so that Synanon, this couldn't happen and Synanon couldn't have their children. So he had been given some threats. I didn't know this till later. I found out later he'd been threatened a bunch of times. Uh, they were basically like back off, like, or something really bad is going to happen to you. Uh, and this is after we left. So we left just to catch you up. Like we left, we didn't have a dime to our names. You know, we, my mom had been in there for 10 years. My dad was still in for a few more months. I think they got divorced before I was born. We just left at my, my grandfather's car. My mom still had a shaved head. Mm. Uh, we went to, you know, my grandparents' house to stay for a few weeks. That was literally it because my mom and my grandmother didn't get along because my grandmother was a pretty raging uh, drunk. We, we moved to East Oakland. Uh, we lived on food stamps. We drank, you know, canned soup out of little styrofoam uh, cups and slept. We would build our big, my mom was trying to try to make it into a thing where, you know, it was nice that we had furniture we could make out of clothes because it meant we could, mm. you know, make them into different shapes. And isn't that fun? So we slept in our jackets, you know, go to the food bank and wait in line and get the government cheese and goodwill for clothes. All our clothes were goodwill clothes. And, I, and my mom, she, she wasn't great about like keeping us super clean. I think we looked pretty ragged at mm. the time. And just, but we were just very poor. I mean, you know, yeah. it's not, it's no one's fault, but we, that's just where the situation we were in. So uh, my mom's friend shows up and says, well, why don't we, you know, pull resources uh, and we can get a house together and we can get out of East Oakland. Cause East Oakland was very, uh, it was a pretty dangerous neighborhood where we live. Somebody broken into the apartment. And I think the one possession we had was like this plastic record player. And some, you know, some of my earliest memories of just like, we would sit there, there was nothing to do. And so we would just put on the record player and listen to it for hours, just laying on these jackets and then when we came home one day and someone had broken in and they stole the record player it was like the only thing we had they were like somebody steal this shoe table <laughs> the styrofoam cups with leftover chicken soup it was a pretty rough time and so uh so we got a house in berkeley and there was this sense like we're gonna move to berkeley and everything's gonna be okay we're gonna live with phil and we're gonna all get along and it's gonna be great uh, and, and he was a really gentle man. He's a really nice guy. And you got to understand, we weren't used to being around men. I mean, we were just two boys, my brother and I, he was three years older, who had just been in this school for all these years, um, this orphanage um, raised by, handed off by essentially a group of women. Most of the caretakers were women. We called them demonstrators. And so men were always a little like, whoa. I mean, our dad would come to visit, which of course we worshiped him. We worshiped our dad. because swashbuckling masculine pirate like ah that was my dad just charming and great guy and warm and funny and you know rode a harley motorcycle and we all we knew all his stories from when he was a professional criminal and all the time he'd done in prison and when he busted out of a mexican prison and when he escaped the cops oh, wow. and all this stuff he was like a folk cool. hero to us. but also just kind of absent and so we're these two boys and we're just fascinated by men because we don't we don't ever see men mm -hmm. and somewhere in our minds we're like Someday we'll be one of these. And I think also when you have a single mother and you're a boy, you, you get a sense uh, of just how rare men are. Um, maybe a good man or something. The idea mm -hmm. that you want a good mm -hmm. man, you got to have a good man. Mm -hmm. He needs to be a good man. Is he being a good man to you? Are they, is he going to help raise the kids? Is he going to be a father figure? And our mom, who is slightly mentally ill, um, of course, just would talk about all this stuff very openly. When you need a father figure, you need to have, Phil can be your father figure. She would, she would say stuff like that to us. So we move into this house in Berkeley. Um, and he is, he's a really nice man. He's really gentle. He's really warm. And he, and I don't think they were dating, by the way. I think they actually were just friends. When I interviewed him for the book, he was, you know, he was pretty adamant on that point. I think he had a crush on her, actually. Uh, but uh, really warm. He was like an anti-nuclear activist guy and he was working on trying to shut down a nuclear reactor in the area and you know, play little games. And the neighbor, one time I remember, thought he was my dad and, you know, he came out and pretended to be my dad and didn't, because he, he knew I felt sort of embarrassed about not having a dad around Aww. and stuff. And so he was a good guy. He yeah. really was a nice man. So uh, we're home one day and he says he's going to go to the store and he comes back from the store uh, and he has this uh, VW bus 
and he gets out of his VW bus. Cause like any good hippie, you have to have the VW bus. Of course. Um, and he gets out and he's got these groceries and uh, I'm on the porch and uh, I should say we weren't generally allowed outside uh, because we, we knew that the Synanon goons were trying to, to get people. We'd heard the stories. Uh, one guy came home and his dog was hanging from the tree. Aww. People who tried to leave, they were called splitties or more often than not these fucking splitties because you were like lower than beings on the planet because you dared to leave the society, you know, and they would beat people up on the way out the door. They would stop them on the highway and beat them up. They would go to different people's houses. They put a rattlesnake famously in someone's mailbox. Uh, right. This lawyer named Paul Morantz and he put his hand in and got bit. And he almost died. He was in a coma. We knew about all these stories. And, and so we were never allowed to play outside. And so the three of us, uh, Phil's daughter and my brother and I, we, we had this garage that we played in. And we'd listen to the kids on the street. Mm. Um, sorry. Mm. So uh, we'd, um, and we'd play our games and do all the stuff we did. Uh, but, you know, we always wanted to go outside and play. So this is one of the few days we actually were, for some reason or another, allowed outside. So I'm on the porch. Um, Phil comes home. These uh, these two men come up behind him, and they're holding these. Uh, I don't know. They were like rods. They weren't quite baseball bats. They were like maybe pipes. I'm not sure. Hmm. They were like black and kind of maybe this big, like a police baton or something. Um, and he kind of looks at me and smiles. And then I, I first I thought they and they had these like flesh covered um, nylons over their faces. Um, oh God. And at first I thought it was like, is someone playing a prank? Is something like, what, why are these guys coming? Is this, maybe they're friends of his, is it like yeah, Halloween? Like, but it all, it's like, you hear about these things. It's just so fast. Everything happens so quickly. And so he just like come up and they, um, they start beating him. Uh, and he starts screaming um, and he fell on the ground. Um, I think a shoe fell off or something. And you mm-hmm. could just hear him screaming on the street. Oh, um and I remember uh, I go to hide behind a like a column and I was watching and I remember our eyes met. And I always remember that because um, mm. he had this look on his face. Um, and it's what's weird is when I interviewed him for the book, I hadn't talked to him in 30 years. And uh, he remembers that moment, too. He was like, wow. I remember being on the ground and looking up and seeing your face. Mm. Sorry. Um, And he said that, um, he said, th- this is, he, what he said to me in the interview was like, I remember thinking this is a, uh, this is something that someone his age shouldn't know about. So all this is happening to him when he's thinking about a kid. Like, this yeah, is what I mean. Right, he's a really good guy. Right. So um, eventually a neighbor comes out, starts screaming at him. There's all these kids. Oh, I should, I should add. So my brother's across the street playing with some kids. Um, and uh, the, the guy's sort of Bill's unconscious bleeding on the driveway oh, no. uh and they say uh, and i'm hiding at this point and uh, they say uh where's mccall and tony because they were coming to get us wow uh, which is of course what we'd been told for months was going to happen but we didn't really believe it hmm. so he asks he dr- they address us to the kids and and they all look at each other uh and because nobody knows who we are because we're always just locked in that garage mm-hmm. uh and uh, my brother, when I interviewed him about all this stuff, you know, he said he just froze and he didn't know what to do. Uh, and he thought for sure, okay, they're going to come get us. But then since nobody knew who we, who we were, they just, you know, they, they left. And I think, you know, there was a sense that police were going to come or something. And then an ambulance came and, you know, I remember my brother screaming and my mom came out and she was screaming on the porch and he went to the hospital and he was, uh, he was in a coma for a month. Uh, yeah, encephalitis. Um, he almost died as well. Uh, and then we moved and then we left uh, to Oregon. My mom had gotten a job at the mental hospital in Salem, Oregon. So we packed up all our stuff uh, and we left. And there was like a moment there where it was like, there's such a feeling of defeat. I remember just, we were driving up the coast and it was raining that day. It always rains in Oregon, but it was raining that day. And <laughs> It was like the sense that we had just lost. Mm. Like the synonym was in shambles and we had all this violence and we were broke. And, uh, you know, I mean, that hung over the whole time I was in Sinan- or sorry, in Oregon. We were there for five years. Just this sense that we went there to hide. 
because right. uh, California was just too crazy and too violent, and we had to we had to hide on the other side of the mountains in this faraway place where it always rained. And how old were you when you left? Six. Six. That's a nightmare. That that is so much for a kid that is literally being chased. Jesus, that's like yeah. what I was scared of every night in bed, but it wasn't real. Right. Knowing that it's real is, I, I mean, that's a nightmare. And seeing it happen, I mean, yeah. that must have been so traumatic. But what's funny is that uh, nobody ever said that. I think now having been through like therapy and being an adult who's read a lot of books about it, I, I'd, I'd be like, yeah, no one ever asked us about it. No one ever asked me about it. Um, we never saw a therapist. No one even said, how was your experience with all this? We were always right. treated as these accessories. We were like these ancillary things to our parents' experience. 